All right, we're glad everybody could join us here tonight. Um, we've been doing a Bible basics. We were doing Bible overview, and when the hurricane hit, decided to uh, deviate from that. And I was going to go back to the Bible overview tonight, but uh, we had talked about uh, eternal security last week. And I got somebody on YouTube that asked the question, how do we overcome sin? And I thought, well, that would be a good topic because so many, uh, so many people struggle with that, and I think churchianity doesn't give the correct answer to that. And really, it's a good time to cover that because it builds on what we talked about last time. Uh, I hope everybody got the chart that I uh, emailed out to everybody. It has life in Adam on the left and then life in Christ on the right. And that's really the answer. You think, well... You didn't say anything about overcoming sin. Well, this is the answer here to understand this. Just like with our salvation, um, we talked about last week that we are eternally secure. How do you know that? Well, because I'm taken out of Adam and I'm placed into Christ. My, where I will spend eternal life in heaven isn't based upon what I do, but it's based upon my identity. Before I was saved, I was identified with Adam and sin. And once I'm saved, I'm identified with Christ and life. And so when you ask the question, how do I overcome sin? It doesn't really matter what the sin is. Um, the answer is living out who you are in Christ is the answer. And, and so what I did was I took basically the characteristics of if you're going to live according to your flesh and your sin nature, then you have that life in Adam. You know, living your life out in Adam, or if you live by the Spirit, getting sound doctrine in the inner man and living by that, then you're living out the Christ life. And I wanted to show the difference because usually when it comes to churchianity, they have you over there in that Adam life. Uh, it's the same thing when it comes to salvation. You know, God's will is for you to be saved, number one, and number two, for you to come into the knowledge of the truth. And the way you're saved is you recognize your sin, you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. There's no works of the flesh that you do. Um, it's because your flesh, in your flesh dwells no good thing. There's nothing you could accomplish in your flesh to please God. And so you have to uh, just believe the gospel simply. And that's, that's how easy it is. But you look at churchianity and they're always adding something to that gospel. Even if they do preach Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they'll add things like walking an aisle, uh, confessing your sins, turning from your sins, uh, being water baptized, making Jesus the Lord of your life, inviting Jesus into your heart. They add these things, and there are works of the flesh, and they figure if they can get you in the flesh, then you'll continue in the flesh, and then they can continue to have power and, and, and over you and get your money, because God's John 4.24 says God is a spirit, and we know from John 17, 17 that God's Word is truth. Uh, as we're going through this message today, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 2. And really, everything when it comes to God's Word is all about, it's about the spiritual. If you want to overcome sin, your sin is in your flesh. So if you want to overcome sin, you've got to allow God to work through your spirit. But that's harder to do as we're going to see it the easy way out is to operate in the sin nature and so that's how churchianity gets the people to come and get them to take their get their money because they point them away from the bible now they may use scripture but they're really pointing them away from applying the principles of god's word to be an overcomer over sin they keep them in bondage to sin keep them in a flesh life so that they can continue to control them if if you know that you've got God's completed word, you've got the Holy Ghost to teach it to you, you've got all things that pertain unto life and godliness, God's abounded toward you in all wisdom and prudence, then for all practical purposes, you don't need the church. Now, it's good to have. It's good to have the fellowship. It's good to have somebody who will, who's studied it out and can give you instruction and you know what the Bible says. But um, at the same time, it's not an absolute necessary thing for you to attend a church building and do whatever they say do because you've got God's word and God himself to guide you. You've got the entire Godhead here. You've got God the Father who came up with the scripture. You've got God the Son who lives it out in your life 
and you've got God the Holy Ghost teaching it to you. So you've got all three members of the Godhead working here. And God never fails, so you know it'll work. Um, so if they pointed you to God, well, then they wouldn't be able to manipulate and control you. And so they point you to the flesh when it comes to salvation, adding things to the gospel. And it's the same thing when after you're saved. Then they add things to that. Um, a lot of times they end up having you dwell on the sin by confessing it and trying to overcome the sin that way. But that's not how we do it. We have to understand, we have to get out of the operating in Adam and get into Christ instead. Look over in Romans chapter 5. Um, these points on the, on the page the notes that I sent, they're pretty much parallel. At least that's what I intended to do. And so we'll look at the first one under life in Adam and we'll compare it to the second one, uh, or the first one under life in Christ. So, life in Adam, actually, for all practical purposes, spiritually speaking, life in Adam is really death. Ephesians 2, 1 says, you're dead in your trespasses and sins before you're saved. So, Romans 5, Romans 5 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So you see in that verse the link there, that one man is Adam, and because Adam sinned, now you have a sin nature, and the wages of sin is death, therefore you will die. Um, sin results in death. So, spiritually speaking, those who are in Adam are dead. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. That's why, if you're trying to use any of the of the things that I've got under life in Adam here, any of these techniques to overcome sin, which is what churchianity usually teaches you, it's not going to work. How are you going to overcome sin if you're dead and you're in your trespasses and sins? There's no power. You know, someone who is dead doesn't have any power within them to overcome that which made them dead. You know, the wages of sin is death, so you're dead because of your sin. You're dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1 says. So, there's no way you can follow life in Adam and overcome the sin. But contrast that with Christ. In Christ, you're made alive. Romans 5 and verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, that's through the offense of Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. If it abounded, it went farther than the sin. You notice in verse 20, Romans 5, 20, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So grace overcame sin. It abounded over sin. So how do you overcome sin? Well, you've got to do it in the system of grace. If you put yourself back under the law and say, I'm going to try really, really hard. I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to keep the short accounts with God. I'm going to pay penance. I'm going to uh, try my very best not to do that sin. Well, what you're doing is now you're just being lured in more and being held captive by that sin. Instead, we need to get into grace. Grace is the solution. It's not me trying really hard or, you know, or dwelling on it. It's the grace that goes beyond the sin, that abounds above sin. So I have to operate in Christ in order to overcome sin. And you can see if you go back to verse 17, Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace. There's the abundance there. Abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. It's the righteousness of God. If you operate in grace, the righteousness of God is really what's going to overcome sin. That's why trying really hard or dwelling on the sin or confessing the sin isn't going to work because then you operate in the flesh. And it's only righteousness that overcomes the sin. That's how Jesus Christ, he did no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 said he was made sin for us. Why? 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Righteousness is what overcomes sin. And the way we receive the righteousness of God is through God's grace. So when we believe the gospel, as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace are ye saved. So I believe the gospel, then God's grace abounds over sin and now the way that I overcome sin is living by the righteousness of God, which is imputed to me the moment I'm saved. Romans 3, you can see in Romans 3, 21. Romans 3, 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. If I put myself back under the law, Galatians 2 says I become a transgressor. But if I'm under grace, grace abounds over sin because now I've got the righteousness of God without the law. And you see in verse 22, Romans 3, 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So that shows that the moment I believe the gospel, the righteousness of God is upon me. And so then I'll overcome sin by righteousness, just like Jesus. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So righteousness overcomes sin, and we receive God's righteousness by God's grace, which is why God's grace much more abounds over sin. So you can see that on your outline there, the life in Adam, really, spiritually speaking, if you're following Adam, you're dead. But if you're in Christ, you're alive, alive in Christ. If you go over to Romans 6, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, and it says, you know, after you're saved, it says in verses 3 and 4 that you are baptized into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then, if you look down at verse 14, Romans 6, 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Okay, ha remember, we're trying to overcome sin. So, before I was saved, sin was my king. That's all I did was sin. But now, sin's not going to have dominion over me. Why? Why is it? Is it because I tried to obey the Ten Commandments? Is it because I kept short accounts with God? Is it because I did penance? No. Those are things that the law says to do. It says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for, this is why, this is why sin doesn't have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Right. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. See, the, when you mention you're eternally secure, as we talked about last week, they'll call that easy believism. They'll say, well, you believe that just so you can get away with sin. But it's actually the opposite. If you don't recognize your eternal security, you'll never be able to overcome sin. Because if you can lose your salvation, then there's, if there's something you can do to lose your salvation, then there must be something you can do to gain it back, or at least to try to maintain it, if you haven't lost it yet. So then I am under the law to do whatever it is, A, B, C, D, and E, whatever the steps are, to maintain my salvation or to get it back or whatever it is, I've got to do these steps. So if it's something I've got to do, then I'm under the law. Well, if I'm under the law, then sin has dominion over me. You just saw in verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For ye are not under the law, but under grace. So the opposite is true as well. If, for, if I am under the law, then sin will have dominion over me. You look over in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, and notice that he says here in verse 16, Galatians 2 and verse 16, he says that you are justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now what churchianity usually does 
is they may agree with this statement and say, oh yeah, you're saved, you're justified because you believed in Jesus Christ. But then Christ died for me, now I got to live for him. So then they put you back under the law once you're saved. But notice what it says in verse 18. Galatians 2.18 says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, the law is destroyed the moment I believe the gospel, as Romans 6.14 says, I'm not under the law, but under grace. So I was under the law before I was saved. The law was my schoolmaster to bring me to Christ. Now I'm justified by the faith of Christ when I believe the gospel. So now I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. But if I build again the things which I destroyed, if I decide, oh, now that I'm saved, I can really live for God. I've got the power to serve God now, and I try to serve God in the energies of my flesh, then what I'm doing is I'm putting myself back under the law, and according to Galatians 2.18, I make myself a transgressor. Verse 19 says, For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Jesus Christ obeyed the law perfectly. That's how I threw the law. He fulfilled every provision of the law so that he overcame sin for me and I received the righteousness of God by grace. And as a result of getting, being in grace and having the faith of Christ and having God's righteousness, now I am dead to the law. Why? Why does God... Remember the, the, uh, the churchianity who says... This is just easy believism that eternal security is a license to sin. They try to put you back under the law and saying you got to live for Christ. But notice, I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. You cannot live for God unless you're under grace. Because if I'm under the law, verse 18 says I make myself a transgressor. If I'm under the law, I'll sin. Why? Because Romans 14.23 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if I'm not living by the faith of Christ, then I'm living in sin. I'm living in sin. I'm not living unto God. I have to be... God doesn't reckon me to be dead unto sin or, or dead unto the law so that I can go and do whatever sin I want. God makes me dead unto the law so that Christ can live in me. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. See, that's me. I can't perform anything there. The moment I believe the gospel, my flesh is dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's the Christ life, the life in Christ that we've got on this right side of the page here. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, I'm not letting the flesh control me. Rather, I'm letting the Spirit, through the sound doctrine that I've learned in God's Word, operate in my life and then my Spirit controls my flesh. Rather than the flesh controlling uh, all three parts there. And I live by the faith of the Son of God. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now obviously Christ is not dead. He died and he rose again the third day. He rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. But practically speaking, if I put myself back under the law after I'm saved, then I frustrate the grace of God. The grace of God was given unto me so that I can live by the faith of the Son of God. And that's the only way I can please God. And that's the only way that I can overcome sin. And if I decide that I'm going to put myself back under the law, as verse 18, Galatians 2.18 says, I make myself a transgressor. And then, practically speaking, verse 21, Christ is dead in vain. Meaning, his death, while it did save me because I believe the gospel and I am going to heaven as a result. Practically speaking, Christ does not live through me. If I decide to put myself back under the law, then I'm not under grace, I'm under the law, so I frustrate the grace of God and then Christ isn't living in me. I'm not serving the Lord, rather I'm serving sin. Look over in Romans 8 and this is the 
key. It's two. The way you overcome sin, and again, it doesn't really matter what the sin is. It's all about operating in the system. There are two systems. There's Adam's system, and there's Christ's system. Adam, Adam, system. Adam is, uh, represents death because he sinned. Christ represents life because he lived uh, the perfect life and lived by what God had told him to do. Romans 8 verse 2 tells us, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So there are two laws. The life in Adam I got on the left side of your handout. That's the law of sin and death. So that means if I decide to do something in my flesh, I am going to sin because, and we're going to go over that next here, because Romans 7 verse 18 says that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. If I decide in the energies of my flesh I'm going to try to serve the Lord, then I'm operating by the law of sin and death. But as Romans 8, 2 says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So I want to operate by the spirit. You know, spirit is capital S, so that's the spirit of God within me. And you notice there's life in that. That's the abundant eternal life that Christ gives us the moment we believe the gospel. If I operate by my flesh, it results in sin and death. Well, then... There's no way I'm overcoming sin. All I'm doing is repeating that pattern of sin and death. And the problem with churchianity is they get people in, they keep them in that life in Adam cycle. They, they have a form of godliness around them, but they're getting people to focus on their sin and how, oh, I got to make sure I stay away from the big sins. I got to show that I had true saving faith. I've got to do certain things in order to please God. And so they're operating in the system of the law of sin and death by focusing on the sin and trying to overcome it. That's not how you overcome it. You operate in a different system. The system of grace and the righteousness of God and living by the faith of the Son of God. When I do that, then I'm operating by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And then I will naturally overcome sin. And it's just like Sports, for example, they say, and I've never played professional ball or even minor leagues or anything like that, but they say, you want to hit a home run, you don't go up there and think, I'm going to hit the home run. The way you do it, and how the good home run hitters, is somebody who goes through the fundamentals. You know, they're, they're thousands of times they've swung that bat using perfect form. They figured out how the best way to hit that ball the form for their body and everything, to hit that ball to go, get it to go the farthest. And they practice that thousands of times. And so then, when the pitch is given to them, it's not them saying, I'm going to hit a home run. It's just they operate in that system. They've got the muscle memory built up. How to hold the bat. How to, where to begin the swing. How to get it to where you hit it the sweet spot and all that. And it's all about that system. And if they concentrate on following the system that they've done thousands of times, then the home runs come a lot easier. Whereas if I'm trying to get the home run, then I'm going away from the fundamentals. I'm looking, I'm trying to get the end result without going through the steps I need to get to the end result. So if I focus on the goal, the end, it's not going to work. I've got to go through the process. And that's how it is with anything. Um, and the reason God made it like that is so that we would understand you want to overcome sin, you don't say, you, you know, pick out the sin, whatever it is, say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to, Lord, help me not to do that. Help me not to do that. I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, I, I'm not going to think, well, I'm not going to think about it. Well, you're thinking about it because you're saying you're not going to do it. And you're so focused on the sin that it takes control. Look at Romans 7. See, this is the issue. In Romans 7, it says in verse 8, but sin, now this is the sin nature. Remember, all of us have the sin nature. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, that's the conscience. So your conscience, or it could be the Mosaic Law, doesn't matter. Um, but it's a law, it's a commandment. So the, the commandment comes, he says in verse 7, let's go back to verse 7. 
What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So, here, uh, the sin nature, all it wants to do is sin. So it wants to lust. The law comes along and says, Thou shalt not covet. So, you know, it says, Don't cover your neighbor, neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's animals. Don't cover covet your neighbor's possessions. And so then the sin nature, verse 8, sin nature takes occasion by the commandment. So now remember the sin nature, all it wants to do is sin. And so it decides, hey, I know a way I can sin. I can covet my neighbor's wife. I can covet my neighbor's possessions because the commandment came and told me not to do those things. So now I know what I can do. I know how to sin in a more effective manner. So sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That's the problem with the commandment. When I'm, and that's why Galatians 2.18 says, if I put myself under the law, I make myself a transgressor. Because the moment I have a law, the sin nature within me, which we still have after we're saved, we're still in this vile flesh, the sin nature within me now wants to try to do whatever that thing is. And so as a result, it says, sin revived and I died. Sin nature revived in me, and so then I sinned. Wages of sin is death, therefore sin revived and I died. And the commandment, this is verse 10, Romans 7, 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. So the law says, do this and live. You obey the law perfectly, you have eternal life. But the problem is, none of us can do that because we have a sin nature. So the sin nature takes occasion by the commandment and deceive me and by it slew me. Hold your place there. Go to Jeremiah 17, 9. Look at Jeremiah 17, 9. And this is why this... The, the, the deception is why churchianity has everybody operating over here in the life in Adam's side and they think they're operating in the life in Christ's side. They're deceived into thinking they're doing the Christ life when they're really doing the same old thing they did before they were saved. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? Now, I think that refers to that sin nature there. After you're saved, the heart is in the, in the spirit and you can allow Christ to live in you. But you still have that vile flesh. So the heart is wicked, but it doesn't stop there. It's desperately wicked. It is so desperate to do its sin that it is deceitful above all things. Not just a little deceit, the heart is deceitful above all things. So your heart will try its best to do its wickedness and is willing to deceive you into thinking that you're doing good so that you will continue to do the wickedness. Going back to Romans 7, because you can see the struggle here. You see in Romans 7, Paul says, he says in verse 22, Romans 7, 22, that I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So I want to do what's right. That's what I want to do. Now, the problem is that my flesh is wicked. So it wants to do what's wrong. So if my flesh tries to tempt me into doing something really bad, you know, like murdering somebody, well, then my spirit say, no, no way am I going to do that because that's, that's against God's word. So then the flesh loses. So the flesh tries to get me to do something really bad and it loses. So what it does instead is it still the flesh still tries to get me to sin, but it will cloak it in a form of godliness. So then that way I can do those things like confess my sins, walk an aisle, make Jesus the Lord of my life, those types of things. And it then those sound good because they're cloaked in a form of godliness. So now I say, yeah, I'll do that because I, then I'm serving God. So I think I'm serving God and doing that, which means, but yet 
I operate in the lust of my flesh, I'm not allowing Christ to live in me. So if I'm operating by the flesh, then I'm still sinning. And the, because my sin nature is desperately wicked, then it doesn't mind looking like it's doing good as long as it's still doing its evil, wicked ways. It's still getting away with its evil, wicked ways, and it actually likes the fact that it's looking good because now I won't try to stop it. If all my sinful flesh tried to do is get me to murder and rape people, well, then I would stop that. And maybe, maybe I'd get real crazy and do one thing every once in a while, but most of the time, if not all the time, I would say, no way am I doing that. That's against what God would have me to do. But if it's something that appears to be godly and then I think I'm doing good, well, then I will keep doing it. And so then the flesh gets satisfied. Well, the flesh is never satisfied, but I'm still doing what the flesh wants me to do and I feel good about it. So I feel good that, hey, I'm a member of this church for all these years and I've got my name on the pew here and I've done given all this money here and I'm doing all these good works. If it's just nothing wrong with doing any of that, but if it's not, if it's just me trying to do it in my flesh, well then it's sin, even though it looks like it's good to others. Galatians 5, uh, hold your place in Romans 7, but look in Galatians chapter 5. And this is another aspect to it. So your flesh is desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. So it wants to do its wickedness. It doesn't mind looking good. And here's another point about your flesh is Galatians 5, 17 is the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So what is it that I would do? Well, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So I delight to serve God. But if I allow my flesh to overcome my spirit, it says, I cannot do the things that you would. So not only is the flesh desperately wicked, it's also deceitful. But the third thing is it lusts against the spirit. Now the spirit is a capital S. See, here's the problem. Before you were saved, whether you were saved at age 5 or age 85, either way, your flesh had complete control of your life before you were saved because all you did was sin. You never pleased God. Your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. You never listen to your spirit because it's dead. So all you did was operate in the energies of your flesh before you are saved. So everything was fine as far as the flesh is concerned. But now, remember capital S here, spirit. So the spirit of God, you believe the gospel, the spirit of God comes within you. And the Spirit, as we talked about last time with eternal security, you are now blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You've got forgiveness of sins. You're um, baptized into Christ. You're circumcised with circumcision not made without, made without hands. The handwriting of ordinances is blotted out the law. You're not under the law, but under grace. Uh, everything has been done for you. And the flesh has been trying to accomplish those things your entire life up to that point and did absolutely nothing. It's sort of like if you were just under a weight, say a thousand pound weight was on your shoulders and it's just been sitting there and you've tried and you couldn't budge it an inch. And someone comes along and with their pinky finger just picks it up, throws it to the side. You would feel pretty weak if someone did that. You look at it and say, man, I've been trying to lift this the whole time. I couldn't even move it, and this guy doesn't even try, and he completely gets rid of it. Well, then you'd say, well, I gotta, I gotta show him. Then you get jealous, you know? You gotta, you gotta show him. That's what your flesh does. Your flesh has been trying to do all these wonderful things before you're saved. Once you're saved, the Spirit of Christ comes in, blesses you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, seals you with the Holy Spirit, gives you forgiveness of sins, uh, takes away the the law, puts you under grace, gives you the faith of the Son of God, gives you the righteousness of God. All of that is just a free gift. And your flesh is looking pretty bad. So what it does is it lusts against the Spirit and it's going to try its deceitful ways to keep you to do the things that you would because it's going to try to get the upper hand again. 
because it's jealous of what the Spirit of God did. And so the problem is then, when you've got a desperately wicked uh, sin nature, you've got deceitful sin nature above all things, and your flesh lusts against the things of the Spirit of God that have been accomplished in your life, then your flesh is going to try all it can to have that form of godliness and make it look good so that you will follow it rather than following the Spirit of God. So that's why when churchianity, you say, what do you do to overcome sin? Well, they'll usually say, you know, well, you need to pray about it. whatever sin it is. You just pray and ask God to deliver you from that sin. Uh, get away from that. Or, uh, or you need to try to... Uh, Try not, you know, say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. And, uh, and what you're doing then is you're dwelling on the sin. But if you dwell on the sin, I'm going to do it. Go back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We saw the issue is that when the commandment came in, it said in verse 9, Romans 7 verse 9, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So if I'm making myself saying the commandment, I am not going to lust in this case. That's the example that Paul gives. Not going to lust, I'm not going to lust. That's the commandment. The commandment has come. Now the sin nature worked with the commandment and then to make me sin more. You see in verse 11, for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, there's that deception again, and by it, by the commandment, it slew me. Here's the problem, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. But what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And that's sort of a, a tongue twister there, but basically what it was saying is that you've got two different systems. And remember we talked about that, two different systems, life in Adam, life in Christ. If I am carnal, sold under sin, and the law is spiritual, then I and my flesh cannot do it. So if I, the life, the only way that I can do the law, obey it, is try not to do the law. In other words, don't put myself under the law, but be under grace. Because Christ is the one who did the law perfectly, and he overcame it for me and blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against me. And love is the fulfilling of the law. God commended his love toward me when Christ died for me. So when I operate in Christ, I'm operating in the love of God, and then love overcomes the law or overcomes the sin that I would do. So the problem is, with churchianity, is they'll say, think about not doing that law, or not doing that sin, you know, or, um, and what they're doing is they're getting you to dwell on the sin, and as a result, you do it more. So how do you overcome sin? It's the life in Christ. It's the, instead of operating by the law of sin and death, you want to operate by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, in the first part there, uh, he says, um, starting in verse 4, Philippians 3, 4, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And then he gives his fleshly qualifications. Verse 5, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So, if anybody could say that he obtained righteousness by the law, which he didn't, but if anybody could say that, uh, Paul was about the closest you could find because of his fleshly qualifications. But verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, because he understood that it doesn't matter how good he is in the flesh, it all falls short, because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. All I will do is sin if I'm in my flesh. So he says, even though I've got these great fleshly qualifications compared to someone else, I am going to forsake that. 
I'm counting them lost so I can have Christ. In verse 8, yea, doubtless. So at first he says, notice verse 7, this is his salvation because it's in the past tense. He says, what things were gained to me, those I counted in the past. I counted them lost for Christ. He says, I, in other words, I recognized I was a sinner. Despite me having all the good works better than most other people, he still recognized that whatever he did in the flesh wasn't good enough to please God. So he recognized his sin and he believed the gospel. So he counted it lost for Christ. That was in the past for his salvation. Now verse 8 is talking about the present. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things in the present. He didn't say, Christ died for me, now I'm going to live for him. No, he says, I counted, past tense, all of the things in the flesh as lost so that I may have Christ. And now that I have Christ, I still count in the present all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You may say, but he's already won Christ. He's already got eternal life. He's already in Christ. Yes, that's true. But he says, I want to operate. I want Christ living in me. Because Christ did such a good job at overcoming sin, I don't want to stop there and say, okay, thanks, Christ. I'll take it from here. No, he says, Christ is the only way to victory. So I'm gonna, I counted all the things in my flesh for loss, and now in the present and continually, I'm continuing to count all things in my flesh as loss and count them but dumb. Verse 9, and be found in him. That's the key is that I'm already in Christ, but I want others to see that I am in him because then they don't see me in my flesh, they see Christ in me. And if they see Christ in me, then maybe they'll believe the gospel and be saved, or if they're already saved, they'll get sound doctrine in the inner man and uh, grow in Christ. So he wants to be found in Christ so that he's a good ambassador for Christ. He says, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so I wrote on your outline the fourth point down under life in Christ. Sound doctrine works with Christ's faith to work out God's righteousness. So, how does the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus work? Well, if I'm, if I'm operating by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, i got to know what that law is all about. So I have to read Paul's epistles and learn the doctrine there. Hold your place there. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7, Paul says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So if it's a hidden wisdom, it's a mystery then it's not something that I automatically know once I'm saved. I've got to dig it out, basically. It says in verse 9, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So I learned in verse 7, there's this hidden wisdom, a mystery that God has ordained for me to learn. But then in verse 9, I learned that I can't do it in my flesh. Because the things that God hath prepared for me, for them that love Him, that would be me and you, you know, all the members of the body of Christ, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man. So I can't use my flesh, once I'm saved, to understand that doctrine. But, verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. And the way He does it is verse 13 which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the reason sound doctrine is so important is because God has this hidden wisdom for me, the mystery. That would be the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, how to operate in Christ. And I can't do it in my flesh because my flesh can't understand the things of God. Verse 14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, 
Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So I've got to have the Holy Ghost teach me these things. And these things are in God's Word. So as I read and believe God's Word, specifically Paul's epistles, because that's the instructions to me today, as I read and believe God's Word, the Holy Ghost teaches it to me. And now I learn what the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is all about. That's why when you go, go over to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. Matthew 4, 2 tells us that. And then it tells you the temptations that were given. In Matthew 4, verse 3, he was tempted by the devil to make these stones be made bread. And in verse 4, Jesus said, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The abundant eternal life that God gives me operates by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and the way that operates is when I live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, how do I know the word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? I've got it right here in my King James Bible. This is God's word to me. So all of it is for me. I understand I've got to rightly divide it, but all of it is for me. And so I need to read it, and the Holy Ghost then, and I read it and believe it. you got to believe it. If you're just trying to put your own interpretation in it, you're just wasting your time. But if you read and believe what it says, the Holy Ghost is going to teach it to me. Then I've got that law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, built up in my inner man. So then when I make decisions, then I'm going to make the decisions based upon God's word. When I'm doing that, I'm living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now I'm living by the faith of Jesus Christ in the righteousness that God has given me, standing in grace. And when I do that then, Romans 14, 23 says, Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. But since I'm living by the faith of Christ, then by definition, I'm not sinning anymore. The sin has been overcome. You notice back in Matthew 4, so we saw he said there in verse 4, It is written. Then at the second temptation... Jesus says in verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again. And then at the third temptation, um, he says in verse 10, Jesus unto, saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. He overcomes, Jesus overcame temptation and did not sin because he used the word of God in every situation. And the only way I'm going to do that is if I read and believe. See, when I'm saved, I know that I know the gospel. I know that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again and gave me eternal life. But, so I know that part, but how do I respond in a particular situation? I don't know that yet. All I know before is the law of sin and death. So then I just operate in that. And when churchianity gets me so focused on sin that i got to maintain my salvation or make sure I have true saving faith, that I'm so focused on that sin that I'm over here in life in Adam the entire time and I never get over here in the Christ life. I don't see the importance of reading my Bible and believing it because I'm so worried about making sure I don't lust or whatever the sin is. And I'm so focused on that. If I'm focused over here, I'm not over here. Just like the baseball player, he wants to hit the home runs. If he's so focused on the home run, he's not going to have the good form. Because he's thinking about, well, where am I going to hit it? How far am I going to hit it? Instead, he's got to focus. I've got to get my put, hold the bat a certain way. I've got to hold it here. You know, I've got to get that swing going at a certain time. I've got to have the right angle, depending on the pitch. You know, I've got to hit it at the right spot. And you get all the fundamentals. If the fundamentals come in line, the end result will be good. But if I'm looking at the end result, my fundamentals are going to be bad, and I'm not going to get the end result. So the so the thing is, i got to get out of life in Adam, and i got to get in Christ. I don't overcome sin by thinking about how I'm going to overcome sin. I overcome sin by reading God's Word, letting the Holy Ghost teach it to me, get it in my inner man. And then I make decisions based upon that. I live by every word that proceedeth uh, out of the mouth of God. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. 
churchianity tells you, make sure, you know, think about it, say, I'm not going to do that sin anymore. You know, and they focus on that. Make sure I confess my sins and keep short accounts with God. Or, you know, the Catholics will say, well, you've got to confess your sins to the priest and then you've got to do penance. You've got to do these things. And Baptists don't say that, but in a way they do. They have their own little system because it's like you feel guilty for your sins and so now you've got to go on a work day or help out the church somehow. So then that way you feel better that you've somehow paid for your sin, although they don't really tell you that. In, because you're over here in Adam and they never told you about life in Christ, you end up thinking that way automatically. But look at what God says you should do. If you want to overcome sin, don't think on that. He says, verse 6, Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry about something. Don't be anxious about it. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, yet let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now notice verse 8. He doesn't say, okay, you're trying to overcome sin. Tell yourself, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to do that sin. No, he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. If you want the peace of God which passeth all understanding, meaning you're not worried about your sin, if you want to overcome that sin, you don't think about the sin, you think about things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. And if there be any virtue, if there's any virtue behind what you do, it's a result of you thinking on these things. It's a result of thinking on the sound doctrine and the things of God in the situation. Instead of thinking, I'm not going to do that sin. I know there's, there's that bar over there. and I know those people at work, they're going to go over there after work on Friday night. I'm not going to go over there. I'm not going to go over there to that bar. Well, you keep looking at it. You know, you keep thinking about it. But if I'm thinking on the things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report then there's going to be virtue. I'm not going to do those things automatically. I'm, in the, I'm following the correct system. I'm in the life in Christ system rather than the life in Adam. And then the final point I wanted to bring up is if you go over to Luke 22, Luke 22, because the greatest temptation that Jesus ever faced was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he faced those temptations in Matthew 4 and those were... You know, he overcame them by the word of God. But in Luke 22, God had said that he wanted, basically wanted him to go to the cross to bear the sins of all mankind. And he knows in his flesh, as God, Jesus didn't mind doing it, but as a man, Ephesians 5.29 says, No man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. So, any man doesn't want to knowingly go and suffer the greatest torture you could have in going to the cross and then dying. No man wants to do that. And so in his flesh, as a man, he is struggling with this. And he's in an agony starting in verse 39, Luke 22. He prays, and he prays in verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Yes, that's Jesus as a man basically saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. I don't want to do it, basically. Then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You notice it is Jesus' will as a man is not to go to the cross because he loves his own flesh. He doesn't want it to die as a man. That's true. But you notice man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So he knows the scripture, he knows that that is God's will. So he says, if, Father, if thou be willing, not, he doesn't say, you know, I really don't want to go to the cross. Will you please make sure that I don't have to go to the cross? That would be a selfish prayer. Instead, he says, he knows he doesn't want to do it, but he says, what do you want me to do, Father? I'm supposed to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So if you are willing, 
Father, remove this from me. But if you are not willing, then your will be done. The focus in this prayer, even though Jesus is in agony and doesn't want to, as a man, go to the cross, his focus is on the Father. So too for us, if you want to overcome sin, you don't focus on the sin, you focus on Christ in you. You focus on the doctrine. You focus on the process, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And as a result, Romans 8, you go back to Romans 8, I don't think it's any coincidence that the chapter starts where we were in Romans 8 and verse 2, talking about the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. That's how the chapter starts. Look how the chapter ends. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's the godly living. You suffer persecution as a result. And even though you go through all these things, verse 37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. You want to overcome sin? You want to be a conqueror? How do you do it? Through Him that loved us. It's through Christ. It's not me and my flesh saying, I'm going to try really hard. I tried hard before, but I'm going to try really hard this time. And then you fail and you say, well, I'm going to try really, really hard. Or I'm going to try really, really, really hard. Or I'm going to think about it. I'm going to overcome. No, because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. If I put myself under the law, I'm a transgressor. I am more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'm conquerors. I conquer the sin through Christ in me. It's all about the life in Christ. Trust the process that God has set up. You go to churchianity and they put you under the law, tell you, you got to obey the Ten Commandments. You got to show you had true saving faith. You got to have those works. What they're doing is they're dwelling on sin, they're dwelling in the life in Adam. But if you trust the process, don't focus on the sin, focus on the one who overcame sin, Christ. Christ is the Word. You focus on the Word, you let the Holy Ghost teach it to you, and you think on those things, then as part of that process, you will naturally overcome sin. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the provision that is in Christ. Help us to do like Paul did in Philippians 3, not to just count it in the past, things, um, these things in the flesh as lost for Christ, but let us continue to count them as lost for Christ, counting them all but done that we may win Christ and be found in Him, not having our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. Help us to live by the faith of the Son of God. Help us to take the time to read and believe God's Word and allow you to strengthen us with might by your Spirit in the inner man so that you, Christ, will be overcomers through us as, you, as we live by the faith of the Son of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me stop the recording here.